<laughs> I'm excited about this episode here today because I have a person on somewhere in the in the world. I think he's in New York, who is a family of mine. He's my first cousin, Ben Fisher. Thanks for joining us. Um, and by way of introduction, I'll do a brief one and I'll let you dive into it further, Ben. But Ben is, like I said, family of, uh, of mine, uh, grew up in Maine, went to school in my backyard at UNC Chapel Hill, got very in, ingrained in that, uh, within those circles around entrepreneurship and, and economics and finance, and Ben, you'll get into it, but um, has been in the spaces of starting businesses, growing businesses, selling businesses, and always had an entrepreneurial spirit about him. And so uh, to this day, he still does it. And so we're excited to have him on this um, on this episode just to talk about those experiences and uh, kind of have some dialogue. So Ben, over to you for a quick intro. Thanks, Cousin Davis. I appreciate that. <laughs> um, no, thanks so much for having me, both of y'all. Um, see the twangs coming out, even though I grew up on a tree farm in Maine. The, I think my four years at, at Carolina, I picked it up a couple... Good. Southern. <laughs> it is never let it go. Um, yeah. So, um, as you mentioned, I grew up, so I grew up on a tree farm in, in Maine and, uh, I've like, I think my first business was probably in like fourth grade and I started picking strawberries and selling it door to door from a wheelbarrow. Um, mm -hmm. I used to use that money to buy HTML and JavaScript books and like, it's like the strangest thing that like, I remember asking that like, remarking to my parents a few years ago i was like you weren't worried that like your kid was like crazy like i was like at such a weird age but like the internet um i was i was born in 85 i'm 38 years old so like the internet had become just like like had, had taken off and like building websites and stuff captured imagination and so uh, i guess i was very fortunate to at least like get this experience of like becoming really interested in something mm -hmm. um and it happened to coincide with the first dot com boom. So there was a lot culturally mm -hmm. happening that also brought my attention to it in spite of living on a tree farm. Um, and I would say like, since then, since that age, like I basically just kept, like I, I ran, I started a company in high school, a website development shop. I worked at, I worked at one during the dot com boom. Um, I studied journalism in college cause I wanted to work in advertising. I was a flash developer. Um, and then at the time, like this idea of building, like, we'll call it like what we'd consider today, like tech startups wasn't really a thing. Um, like Facebook came out my freshman year at Carolina. And again, that's not an app, like the iPhone wasn't out yet. So like this concept of like, like I had, I, when I was thinking of like building a company, I was thinking in the context of, oh, well, like build an ad agency or something like that. It wasn't until a couple years after college that I think when the iPhone came out, this concept of like, we'll call it like digital first, like apps and stuff like tech companies that purely just like exist online and feel like software or are built with software that that became a thing. Cause all other software companies at that point, you might have like Adobe or something where they're creating like tools and software, but that's, that's a very different type of thing than we'll call it like Uber or even Facebook or the types of businesses I build. Um, and so for the last 10 years, I've been focused specifically on building, uh, well, in the e-commerce e space and building tools that help e-commerce brands that sell on Shopify increase their revenue. Um, so there was a period in between college and I'd say like my focus on e-commerce where I built a bunch of different like B2B software companies that like one of the unifying challenges for me certainly early on was identifying a sustainable or even a healthy business model. And so after a couple of really painful experiences of like building a, a cool product that people loved, but I couldn't figure out, out how to monetize it uh, well enough, I was like, you know, what? I'm just going to focus specifically on a, on a, on like a problem and an, uh, a market that a, I can become like super like experienced at and knowledgeable about and that it focuses and that it inherently makes money. So e-commerce to me was like a really attractive space because it's like, if I can help people who are making money, make more money, that's a pretty straightforward revenue model. As long as I'm able to like essentially be attributed that increase in, in revenue. Um, hmm. So my past, like several businesses have all the revenue models has been focused on. Basically we get a percentage of your upside. Like if we help you make more money. So as hmm. long as, as the software and the tools that I'm building, like accomplish what like the promise of them is, then, you know, we have a, like a scalable business. Um, 
so I kind of, I, I jumped, I fast forwarded through a bunch of that stuff, but like, as you mentioned, I've, um, yeah, I've been focused on e-commerce, have built a bunch of tech companies, uh, sold a couple, have had several failures, uh, or we'll call them lessons. <laughs> and I'd say a lot of the products I've built, um, it's just, so my background's that, so I'm a designer and a programmer. So I'm actually the, I like for all of my businesses, I typically build the first version myself. And if I see it like a, an opportunity or like a market, like then I'll either like raise money or I'll, you know, in some cases bootstrap that business. But ultimately, like I'm the one typically tinkering and like trying to figure, like I have a product idea and I'm trying to figure out if there's some sort of business here. And then I build a team around me who's more experienced and specialized at all the things. Like I'm a, I, I was, I mean, I, I, I say that uh, I'm like an okay designer. I'm an okay programmer. I'm not necessarily, I'm not, great at, at any of those but i think my like kind of what i bring to the table is that i know how to do both and I'm, I'm good at both um i'm not great at both um or great at either i'm good at both and that combination of the two combined with like the we'll call it like the business lens um you know that to me that intersection of those three things is i think probably what uh of, of like advantages i have it's it's really the the fact that i i my interest is in the connection of all three. So Ben, it sounds like you are, are heavily involved in, in not just e-com, but really technology in general. There are so many new tools. Uh, I, mm -hmm. I consider myself a tech enthusiast, you know, with marketing these days, it's it, marketing has changed so much, as you know, um, over the last 10 years, I would say 10 years ago, you didn't have such a, an emphasis on data consumption, data analyzation. And, and today you do. Um, in fact, 10 years ago, it was unheard of that a CTO would be involved in marketing, whereas now mm -hmm. a lot of CTOs are seeing marketing fall under their jurisdiction because there's so much data yeah. that they have to contend with. Um, when you think about, though, the, the changes in technology, what is something, what's a tool or resource that you find the most intriguing, the most exciting? I think, again, AI is all the buzz, but, <laughs> but what is something that you find just absolutely fascinating, whether it's now or the future of it? It's funny. I was intentionally not going to say AI. Yeah. I was like, I was like, I, I'm going to come intentionally come up with something that's not AI. I, cause I do, I do experiment a lot with AI. Um, yeah. yeah. And I was pretty early in also blockchain. Um, oh, yeah. that was yeah, my, my, in one of my earlier businesses, we actually started going through the process of doing a white paper, um, around because we were going to do an ICO back in that first wave of ICE trying to monetize uh, yeah. on, on, on tokens. But um, no, so I, I would, I'm a very early adopter, sometimes too early. I try a lot of tools um, and I'm like a optimization productivity nerd. So like I, I would say half of, I, I wouldn't say it's fun, but like what my friends always ask me is like, what should I do to accomplish this workflow? And I'm like, here's the tool you use. Here's the one you don't use. Here are the pros and cons. Cause I, for whatever reason, I get like a sick pleasure out of just trying different things and figuring out how to connect them or not. So to answer your question around, uh, like a tool or technology that I'm excited about, uh, let me, let me think for a second, because admittedly a lot of what I've been playing with is AI and trying to figure out how to not just, um, like how to truly like, cr like find something that's valuable not just interesting and fun well, like as an example you know davis and i talked about ai probably a few weeks ago if i'm not mistaken mm -hmm. and everyone is talking about chat gpt and i think a lot right. of people are struggling especially if you're not in the tech space how do i use it on a daily basis what really mm -hmm. is the benefit um I, I would not say it is the best resource today for really good blogs i would say if you're just trying to put something out there that's quick and dirty it's probably a good resource but something really technical uh, with that human touch, it's not ideal unless you're mm -hmm. using it just as a framework. If you're taking it and saying, all right, I want to get the framework of this blog. I need some ideation going, and now I'm going to put it in into my own words. I'm going to really revamp it. Mm -hmm. I think that makes a ton of sense. But where I have found the most value in chat GPT specifically, and there's a lot of these tools out there now, is really almost using it just as a an idea station. I'll start there and say, hey, right. you know, I'm, I'm struggling. I'm having writer's block with this. You know, what are some some concepts? And it'll spit out a bunch of stuff. And oftentimes, it just gives me a good jumping off point. Whereas in times past, I would sit there for maybe 30 minutes, do a bunch of research, and end up coming up with some of the same um, suggestions that it's giving me. So I find that it just saves me a ton of time on the front end, but you still have mm -hmm. to massage it quite a bit to make it your own, to make it authentic to you and or your brand. 
Yeah, no, I mean, I think, I mean, the interesting thing, I guess here we are, we are actually talking about AI. Fine, I'll, I'll cave. <laughs> um, so what's, like, what I'm always searching for, especially when it comes to AI, is like, how can I legitimately be more productive or impactful, right? Hmm. Not just, like, I mean, mid journey is cool, but that's not really that interesting to me. Uh, you know, if you're in some ways, yeah, it can be like a cool sort of brainstorm partner, but is it actually making me 10 X more creative? I would say in some cases, yeah, like a lot of it comes down to prompt engineering, right? So the, it's oftentimes, it's rare that there's like a single prompt you can offer that like salt, like we'll say like gets an amazing response. It's like massaging, which is kind of frustrating because I feel like oftentimes it takes like a bunch of back and forth and like almost me like writing like a page and a half where it's like broken up into sections just to like provide enough context for the chat GPT to actually be like somewhat useful. Um, I've experimented with more focused AIs like Jasper writer. Mm -hmm. Um, like, cause part of what I was trying to figure out is like, is it better to use something that like, what kind of where I've arrived at is like chat GPT is great for gen as like, we'll call it general knowledge. Yeah. It's not, it's not great for writing. So if you're using as a brainstorm buddy, that makes a lot of sense. And I think that's a great use case for it. You can look at something like Jasper or writer.com, which are more, which are specifically trained. The models are trained around like writing. Um, Claude is an AI I actually use now even more than chat GPT. Claude, C-L-A-U-D-E. They just raised um, I think something like a billion dollars uh, like a week ago from, uh, I think it might've been Google. Uh, I don't remember who it was, but it's, like, it's actually the most... Dumb. But yeah. it sounds like a ridiculous number, but for them, it may not be enough, which it is why not be, I mean, chat GPT or uh, open AI needs to raise more money. Um, it's crazy yeah. the, how expensive this is, but like, so like what, and I guess where I'm going, this is like the most useful, I would say the most impactful workflow for my life has been, uh, so I record all my meetings and, uh, and I use a tool called grain and mm. The value of that in part is because like when I'm in a conversation, I'm gonna be able to focus on what the person's saying. And grain is great because it shows me like a little notepad where I can like I have different emojis that I can trigger or click on rather to like indicate specific moments in a conversation where I'm like, ah, oh, this is something that's like gives me gave me an idea, or this mm -hmm. is something that is concerning. Like if a customer is saying they don't like something, like it provides essentially a, a, a contextual bookmark in the conversation. What I'll do is in grain. So grain's great. Like grain has its own AI that like does some summary stuff. I find the summary is like, okay, it's not that great. Um, but it will often capture, it'll identify when someone says they're going to do something. So it actually will say, here are the next steps you guys indicated in your conversation, which can be pretty mm -hmm. useful. But oh. actually like what, what I, what I'll do is I'll download the, it'll correctly identify who said what, which is valuable in itself because it like who the speaker is. Like if it's Ben or if it's Davis or it's Ted, um, I'll download a, a transcript of it as a Word document. I will upload that Word document to Claude. And as a prompt, I will say, please summarize the conversation and highlight key points. Oh. It will go through and it does an amazing job of actually extracting, I would say, like relevant and useful tidbits that were in the conversation. And then you can have a back and forth conversation with Claude saying, oh, what? tell me more about what Davis said. And then you can even do things around like, you know, let's say that like, just for sake of conversation, like I'm an expert, I would say junk, junk removal entrepreneur. I, 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 and like, here's like, what, I, like, what, what are some like, content ideas or what are some problems that I, that, 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 that you would likely have? Mm -hmm. um, sorry, I kind of switched like if it's me or if it's Claude, what I meant was tell Claude that Claude is a expert junk uh, removal entrepreneur and then be like, what are the things that keep you up at night? And it's like, that's like super helpful just around like, again, like the types of responses you get from Claude or a, it's, it, it, it comes across much more. I don't know how they do this, but like the actual like output is much better. And because you're able to upload this transcript, it can also take context from the conversation. And so I can start asking specific, specific questions that maybe even, or like comments that like Davis made. And I, you know, it's taking that and also combining with the fact that it's an expert at like junk removal itself. And so I can say like, what are other challenges that someone like yourself or, or Davis would be like, you know, navigating or, or 
whatever. Um, sometimes I'll ask you for like, what are some smart follow-up questions that I should ask? And it will actually give me like really good. I, I like so far it'll give me actually really good, thoughtful, um, follow-up questions where, you know, like I'll take a couple of those. And I'm like, shit, actually I should use this and uh, follow up with the person I met with, or even just think about myself. There's so many questions and rabbit holes I could go down, Ben, just based on how you <laughs> opened up. Um, I'm going to settle on, based on your skill set, you obviously could have gone and probably still can, definitely still can. You could go and get a job at a number of different companies and basically do what you want from a job perspective. Why have you chosen to, to not go that route, be an entrepreneur, start your own things, join forces with other entrepreneurs, grow things from the ground up? you know, go the, go the fun fundraising route and, and basically just be your own boss for, you know, the amount of time that you've been even in high school or in through college, you've had ventures, but like post-grad, mm -hmm. why have you gone down that path versus going and getting a, you know, a corporate job? Yeah. I, and you know, what I'll, to give some context, I'll say like, I've had there. Have, so I've been out of college. I graduated in 08. So I think that was, uh, 15 years ago. Um, oh. I worked for a company, an ad agency right after college that I had interned at. I worked there for, I think about seven months, the finance, like the finance, the economy collapsed. The company ended up going like out of business. Mm -hmm. I got laid off and that was actually my first sort of impetus or my first transition from working full time, uh, to like, I shifted to, I basically, I also, I, what I did learn from that experience was like, I don't really like this, um, it had less to do with being, a, an, we'll call it like working full time at a company, but I was, I had a bunch of ideas that I wanted to like, that I was curious about that I wanted to see if I could figure out how to make them into businesses. So mm -hmm. what I did was there was like a two and a half year transition where I would freelance as a, as a art director and programmer slash flash developer for ad agencies. I worked with Ogilvy and Mather. I worked with uh, J. Walter Thompson. I worked with IDEO. And what I would do is I would, I would freelance to make save money. Like I, when I graduated college, I literally had zero dollars in my bank account. And so like I had to make enough money to like cover my bills. And I lived in New York city. And so like I would freelance for a bit, I would launch a product if I thought like, and then I would like stop freelancing. Cause that was one of the benefits. And I would say that I was very fortunate because of my particular skill set. this concept of freelancing was like, um, I mean, it, it was like, if you were a project manager or like an account manager or account director, like you couldn't have done that. The only sort of, at least within the advertising industry, the only role where this concept of freelancing actually was like popular was if you were a creative or a developer. So I, I was fortunate in that. Um, and that enabled me to like, basically like launch products. If it didn't work, I'd go back and I'd freelance again until I'd saved enough money to like launch another one. And then eventually some of those products started working. Um, I also got really creative in reducing my burn. Like I shared a, I had a two bedroom apartment in the Upper East Side. And at one point a buddy and I shared a bed. We slept in like different ends of the bed was, and like we rented out the other room and like we were, and I was like, we were dating people at the time too. So like, we weren't both often there at the same time, but like, I was just trying to figure out a way to reduce costs, um, and be able to like stick it out. And it was really, it was a really cool time because I had just graduated college too. My friend, he started his own company as well. And so we were just trying to figure out how to survive in New York. Um, maybe survive is a bit of a <laughs> overly dramatic term for it, but like, you know, we didn't have money. And so we were just like, how, you know, we, we basically, by Airbnb being out that extra bedroom, I was able to almost cover you know, a good portion of the rent of, of, of the apartment. Um, and so it was not like overnight where I was like, oh, I'm just going to go out and start a company. It was for me, it was a bit more of a gradual transition. Um, and then once I had like some stable income, uh, the first, then I was able to like, it, we'll call it, I was, I could still always freelance if I wanted. And after I sold uh, my previous company, Cart Hook, uh, there was about a year, I think about a year maybe a year and a half where I was freelancing again as sort of like a fractional CTO for subscription e-commerce brands. Again, I stayed in like the e-commerce market. Um, cart hook was a software P was software for e-commerce brands to increase their, uh, sales through post-purchase upsells. So I was staying in like my space and I basically was, I thought I wanted to build a company around subscriptions. And so what I did was, I consulted for subscription companies and it sort of doubled as customer development around what I thought my next thing would be. And it was an area that I had a lot of expertise and interest in. 
um, with cart hook, we raised an angel round. And so we, it was mostly from friends and family. Some were professional investors, but like, it was mostly just, they happened to be professional investors. It was really friends and family, uh, who were entrepreneurs as well. Um, and that was my first experience raising money. And, um, then for my most recent company rodeo, we raised again, uh, ain we'll call it like two angel rounds. Um, and I'd say in the context of startups, we haven't raised that much money relative to like all the other companies. <laughs> um, certainly like around that time when we raised, like it was, you know, a lot of com like early companies were raising a lot of money and which frankly for me just didn't sound like the, uh, right or wrong it's it wasn't it wasn't the it wasn't the the, the strategy that that we were going after um mm -hmm. and so yeah it's uh you know my decision to continue to build companies you know i've taken what i'd consider rests in between the businesses um like as i mentioned like I, when i was consulting for a brand after cart hook that was really important because i frankly wanted to save up money we hadn't sold the business yet um, I was, I didn't want to be the boss for a while. I wanted to only be worrying about paying my own bills as opposed to like making sure the company was making enough and like growing a team. And, you know, it's, it's really, it's a lot of, uh, you know, I'll call it like, we take this on as responsibility if you're going to start a business. Uh, it's stressful and, you know, um, and you know, I, I do really enjoy, aspects of consulting i really enjoy and i really enjoy seeing and sort of being able to learn about other people's businesses and so i'd say that like it's not that i want and will only build my own companies um i think sometimes it makes sense oftentimes it's more i'm like i'm i am starting companies in spite of knowing better right like i see something I'm like oh there's an opportunity here I know exactly, like I have an idea and a vision of how we can do that. And like that often gets like the best, like the best of me. I'm like, oh yeah, this is how hard it was. I remember now. <laughs> um, so there, there's a bit of a, I wouldn't call myself a masochist, uh, but I would say like, oh yeah, it's almost like the optimist. And uh, I will say over time, moments of it have gotten easier in part because I just have a lot more perspective where I've like gone through stuff before dealt with like co-founder breakups, all the, all of the drama that you experience. It's like the first time you go through it, it's freaking heartbreaking um, and really challenging. At least it certainly was for me. And then as you go through those experiences, if it comes up again, you just have more experience in like tools to like navigate it or anticipate yeah. like, this is what might happen. And then like, you know, I think, um, yeah. So for me, entrepreneurship, I don't think you need to own your own company to be an entrepreneur, right? I think um, part of what I do look at is like the potential upside. Like that is part of what gets me excited. I think that um, I really want, I'm willing to take on risk. I want to get rewarded for winning and I'm, I'm comfortable. I would say it looks like uh, not. With that said, like, I'm not like an Elon Musk who's like, I'll bet everything. I'd say I'm very calculated. Like, I'll take calculated risks because cool. one of like the early sort of, I'll call it a story I told myself was, and I think part of this was just to reassure myself psychologically was like, I know that no individual business will work or may work. And like the way to win at this is to keep doing it. And to know that as long as I'm continuing to get better, and if there's areas like e-commerce where I can continue to build a network and like focus on building companies in this space, each time I build a company, I'm a bit more prepared and better equipped to like, to, I would say like to, to be successful. Like uh, I'm swimming in, in, in the, in like, in like a, a fertile part, fertile is the wrong analogy if I'm used to talking about swimming, but like I'm, I'm swimming where the waves are. And I'm not changing industries. I'm staying in a space. So like the network and the connections that I'm developing are all relevant. And these are people that I'm able to like, you know, exercise relationships if it's helpful around like strategically. So uh, for me, it's been very intentional about like the kinds of businesses and like why I've done what I've done. Yeah. Um, certainly not the only way to do it. I know people who've done, taken very different approaches, but it's how I've thought about it. Ben, whenever I talk to entrepreneurs, my favorite question is to ask the current Ben 
if you could go <laughs> back and tell the Ben right out of college the best advice, what would you tell your younger self, fresh out of college? Um, I mean, I guess I'd be like, we'll call it, there's practical advice, and then there's like, we'll call it the psychological, emotional advice. I think younger Ben would need to hear both. Um, <laughs> yeah. I think the, we'll start with the practical advice, because that's easier for me to sort of succinctly say, which is, I'd be like, I'd be like, Ben, Ben Jr. <laughs> um, I know you love products and I know, I know you love being creative, but like, you know, at the end of the day, the best product doesn't necessarily win. What matters is like, we we'll call it sales and like figuring out distribution and monetization. Yeah. And I think that, um, you know, th those are both things that I have improved dramatically at. And, um, you know, for my previous business, um, I partnered with someone who specifically was a marketer who had built and sold an e-commerce brand. So he had been like sort of our, our, he had, he had been like our target customer before starting that company together. And I was very intentional. I was like, all right, I'm like, I have a, I'm good at engineering. I'm good at product. I have a, I have a business mind, but what I want is someone to compliment me on the marketing and sales side. And I, at that time, didn't feel prepared to do it myself. And so I was just like, that is what I need because all, if we can solve that, I know that I can figure out the tech and product piece. Um, and so uh, I wish I had learned that lesson earlier. I'm sure I, I know I, had, I probably had heard it um, around like importance of, of distribution and product. Um, I think the other practical piece that I would say there is it's like, like sometimes if things aren't working, like on one hand, it's like, this is why measuring is so important because there's a lot of advice out there of like, never give up. Like I'm a huge fan mm, of Alex from yeah. Rosie. I don't know if both of y'all follow him. Like he, I've gotten a lot and you know, you see these personalities and I agree with a lot of it. And a lot of it gets me really like, super stoked is like, never give up. If you don't give up, you'll never lose, which is true. And I don't think, but like, I think a lot of us keep trying to do the same stuff over and over again. And sometimes like there's two things that happen. One of which is if things aren't working, like, you know, when things are working, like I've built enough companies and built enough products now, like whether like sometimes not even because I did so, like, not because I built a great product. It's like, I got the market right. Or I got, and I got lucky, but it's like, I've seen, I've been in this long enough to see it, see when things work and when they work, it's like, holy smokes, this is growing so fast. Like people love it. Even if it's like a, like somewhat crappy product or, or we'll call it like unfinished, unpolished product there have been moments where like, and sometimes it's taken iterations and like an evolution of a product to get there. It's not like you build it and like, it's rare that you build something, the first version of it, and people are like, oh my God, that's amazing. But that goes back to, again, I think it, like the importance of really understanding the problem you're trying to solve mm. as opposed to starting with the product and being like, oh, who wants this product that I built because it's a cool idea. Um, but really recognizing that I was going to say like the, going back to the Hermosi comment, it's like, there've been moments, like I'm one of my early businesses that I, I stopped. I, I think I stuck with it for two years and probably for a, the last year of that, like we weren't growing, right? Like we were working on the product. We were working all the time. I was figuring out ways to cover my bills. And, you know, in hindsight, I was like, man, I should have stopped that much earlier. Um, you know, I am of the personality where I was like, I'm not going to give up. Like winners don't quit. Um, and, you know, I learned a lot through that building that business, but I learned a lot more in my next company where, you know, happened to get a lot more of the details correct and like got lucky and stuff. And I just think of the amount of sort of like exhaustion and pressure and in some ways like mental grief I, I went through. I was like, man, I didn't need 80% of that. I, I could have learned the lesson with just going through some of it. <laughs> yeah. um, and I've had those moments. And like, one of the things I always keep in mind is like, you know, certainly early on in a product or a business, I'm thinking, do I need to work harder? Do I need to do something differently? Or is this like a signal that it's not the right business? Mm -hmm. And, you know, getting feedback from other founders around like, how do you make that decision? Especially if a lot of your identities around working hard and like associating culturally, quitting 
with failure. But I've also talked to a lot of people who are like, you know, it's sometimes it's smart to, I mean, it is smart to quit if something's not working. Like, mm-hmm. like what you should be doing is trying to try figure out what part of it's working and like, you know, figure we, something like just, an yeah. iteration of it. But like, um, I also think there's only so much, I hate to say like gas in the tank, but there's only so much gas in the tank. At a certain point, it's like you're, you're cutting against bone. And for mm-hmm. some of us, um, you know, you get, I would, and I'm projecting a bit, but I'm also speaking to like my experience of having a lot of friends who are entrepreneurs. Like you can get to a place where it's like, you're just like, it's like you're on your last leg and it's like, it's very unlikely that you're able, that you have the emotional energy to be able to turn it around. Mm -hmm. And I think, um, being able to like navigate that and identify that is really important. And a lot of that's like introspection around like, are you still excited about the idea? Do you think you guys can still win? Um, so I've thought a lot about that over the years. And, um, I think just saying that to my younger self. And I think with that, I would say you're going to go through a lot of shit and that's, you know, some of it will work out. Like not every single, we'll call it like challenge and roadblock is going to be, uh, cause at the time it, it oftentimes felt like, well, I'll never, I'll never figure this out. Uh, this is. I'm I, I'm an idiot. I'm not good at this. And then you get it right, or you you may find something that works. I'm like, oh wow, that like built up my confidence a bit. And I think what I even tried to remember today is like, like these setbacks don't mean or don't reflect your value as a person, mm-hmm. right? Oh, and um, I think a key part of being able to emotionally navigate all of the crap as founders that. Uh, we all go through, and I'm sure both of you have like, obviously have your own stories. It's like, you have to not associate yourself with like, we'll call it, we'll just see, we'll say failure, Sure. Uh, associate yourself and your identity with that failure, which is really hard. I struggle with it. Um, (laughs) because otherwise you're just going to like, feel like crap. I'm sorry, man. Have you ever read the book failing forward by John Maxwell? I have. Yeah. I don't remember. I've read a few of his books. Um, it, yeah. You just it, they just triggered me because I, I remember when I read that book for the first time, it was such an eye opener of how many entrepreneurs, highly successful business leaders had failed on a colossal scale before they found that huge success. And mm-hmm. I, I read a statistic. Um, I want to say it was from the millionaire next, next door years ago. And it talked mm-hmm. about how the average successful business owner today failed. Their first four businesses were complete failures before they found that one that was a success. Um, have yeah. you found that to be true as well? I mean, it's almost like you need some of those setbacks to really teach you some of those tough lessons that you don't learn in college that your buddy's not going to tell you, maybe not even in the book. Yeah. I mean, for me, I think the interest, like, yeah. And I've tried to get better at, I mean, everyone wants to fail fast. Yeah. Um, easier said than done. And there's a lot of, I'd say like emotional ramp up. I think oftentimes, like I've seen some people who've launched like, I mean, when I actually at one point created a chronology of all the products I've launched, I think I've built about 30 at this point. I would say of wow. those products, may, I think five of those re- turned into like legitimate businesses. <laughs> and of those, um, two of them were successful. Uh, at least three of those, I think three... Yeah, three, like I ended up closing, or maybe two I closed. Um, but like a lot of energy went into those initial, like those products that never even turned into an actual business. Um, and so I have a, I think part of the trick is being able to like take like low risk te- like bets and tests, which yeah. I'm still trying to figure out how to do stuff faster. I was just going to um, ask you, how, but how do you determine <laughs> the low risk, you know? Especially when you're that guy, because I think you just said it, mm-hmm. you know, you see this next cool thing. And you're like, oh, my God, I, I'd love yeah. to get involved in that. And I think if you have that DNA, it's so hard to get away from that. So how do you calibrate your focus and say, you know what, this is the low risk I'm going after? I think part of that is in becoming an expert in a space. So for mm-hmm. me, like if I get interested in something e-commerce, I'm looking at it with the eyes of someone who has a lot of context and a lot Mm. of experience that can also make me blind to some stuff um, and overlook some things. But ultimately, 
I can test ideas faster because I know people I'm connected to merchants. I know who like, like the different segments of the customer base are I'm following the trends. Uh, so I'm just much more of a subject matter expert. So I, I just naturally know a lot more that that's a big piece of it. So specializing or, or picking an area. Um, I think having a framework and there's a lot of, I mean, lean startup was one of the, uh, uh, sort of like really impactful, I'd say like approaches to entrepreneurship for me. Um, and that not all like it and like Steve Blank, uh, who is, uh, Eric Reese's professor, uh, wrote, uh, the four steps of the epiphany, is it four steps or six steps. I can never remember how many steps it is. Uh, <laughs> I think four, four steps. I don't know. Um, well, but that was also very impactful, which it was, the focus was around like customer development. Part of what was great there too, is talking about like, if you have a product rather than changing the product, sometimes it, what matters is like change the, change the market. Um, I think that like the advice typically that you would see now is like, it's easier to change your pro like, change the product or change the solution than it is to change the market. If you really understand a market, um, because all that information and knowledge you have about a certain, if you really know a customer or like a ideal customer profile, that's really valuable. And it's really risky for you to try to like, um, try to learn from scratch a different type of customer. Yeah. Um, so it's, but like, there's a lot of stuff out there around, Again, like sort of how do you go about and like what's the sequence in which to like test things and validate or invalidate? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and then there's like a, an enormous, there's a million resources and people Googling or, or uh, blogging about it around how do they go about approaching failing fast. Ben, you know, you know what's interesting back when you were talking about what you would say to your younger self, one thing that re one, of, one of the things that resonated with me that you said was, on your practical advice and a quote came to mind was that it's not always the best products that win it's oh, yeah. you know something along the lines of the best execution right who, who can take mm -hmm. an idea and just go execute it? and we've all heard that yeah. along with a million other things in a lot of different places and platforms right it's interesting to hear you know i feel like messages resonate differently with people based on context who's saying it when they're saying it and obviously mm -hmm. you know and I don't know what the moment is, right? But you're a uh, family to me. And it's not mm -hmm. like I've never heard that, but it just, it hits differently when somebody like you says it on a, on a uh, podcast like this, given the context of my experiences that I now have as a, as a business owner. And that is to sum it up, I would say for folk, like if I were to listen to this 10 years ago, 15 years ago, or young people, you know, in, in middle school and high school that follow Alex Hermosi or anybody else on YouTube online, they're hearing all of this stuff, right? They're hearing all of it. They're hearing things from uh, people like us and people like them, like, hey, you know, maybe it is okay to not associate your inner worth with what you do in business. Like you're not always a failure because your business failed or, or you had to pivot. Um, but it's, it's interesting to hear it from somebody who, I think you said you're 38, who's been through a lot of different businesses and things to now you're the one telling your, your younger self that. So I guess my point is like, as a young person, we probably need to listen to those age old sayings <laughs> and advice from people that have done it before us um, and really take that to heart because I think intuitively, and I know I'm this way, I'll hear something like that and it'll make a lot of logical sense, but I won't mm -hmm. necessarily go and, and execute it. I won't really believe it in my real life. You know what I mean? Like I'll mm -hmm. still try to push through and make this business work, even though I should probably pivot somewhere else or shut her down. Or um, I will continue to, to be a product, uh, a creative type and just create product after product after product. And I know one's gonna catch, but like really you should have a, a singular focus much to like what Alex Ramosi preaches a lot, stick to something, you know, you're never going to be, Ted and I talked about this recently, you're never going to be better than the guy that does one thing all the time. If you're doing four things and this thing gets 25% of your time, this one, this one, and this one, they all get 25. You're never going to beat the guy that's spending a hundred percent of all this time on that one bucket. So mm -hmm. uh, I guess that's just the point that I'm trying to make <laughs> anybody listening, like take that advice and, you know, 
you don't have to come up with the latest and greatest idea. You don't have to introduce a new smartphone to the to the market. You don't have to come up with Web four. Like if you have an idea, even boring businesses like laundromats, junk removal, um, any home service business that's been around for a while. If you if you have an idea and you feel like you can go and maybe introduce something a little different in the marketplace, or just do it better than the next guy, that's a really valuable thing to go execute on. Learn the ropes, learn what works and what doesn't. And, you know, come back to the drawing board at some point years down the line and figure out what mistakes you made, if any, what's working, what's not, and if you need to stick with it or, or pivot. So I just, I thought that was great. I don't know if you meant to go there, but that, that, that resonated with me. I mean, it, what's, what's funny, Davis, what you just said is like, I mean, I, I, I heard it too when I was younger, right? Like, um, certainly the, because I mean, I graduated in 08. A lot of companies have failed. I also had like mentors who were entrepreneurs. Like I heard the message a lot of like, don't internalize it. Yeah. I would say that it's one thing to hear it. And sometimes you do hear things and it like, well, it'll, it'll hit different, right? Like something like, like there's some expression that basically like you'll, you can, you'll hear the same thing and it'll, you'll, it'll resonate when you're, when it's ready to, or when you're meant yeah. to, I, I'm, I'm yeah. butchering whatever the expression is, but like, yeah, I, the point of it being like, there's certain moment, there's certain periods where you're ready to receive a message. And to, like, cause for me, it's like, I, mm -hmm. I, in, I, in, until even today, like I intellectually know that most startups fail. I intellectually understand, but you can even say the same thing about dating. Like, I, I understand intellectually that you're going to get rejected most of the time. Does it feel good? No. Does it impact your confidence? Yes. Right. Yeah. Like, and so it's not enough just to intellectually, at least for me, it's not enough for me just to intellectually need because you need to like believe it. I think part of that, some of this stuff, unfortunately, you just need to experience. Right. Um, and like, it's not, I wish it was as simple as just having knowledge um, as opposed to like figuring out how to like, I would say like, like use it. <laughs> um, certainly one of the things that you'd mentioned around like when to pivot one of the really important things I've learned is like, what exactly is a pivot? A pivot is not, and this goes back to when I was saying, like, oftentimes you stick with the same customer, assuming that like, for me, it's like, I like, we had a piece of software at one point where I was debating, like, like there was like the area was, the space was getting commoditized. And I was like, can we take the same product and use it with a different customer where like the market's not as saturated? And I had some ideas or we had some ideas of like where we like the type of customer where this might resonate. But I realized we know so much about our customer. We're better off like figuring out if there's like, a, like that wouldn't be a pivot. That'd be basically be starting over because we'd have to go out and figure out like what market actually like needs this. And like, it would just be, a, it would be, it wouldn't be a pivot. It'd be like starting a completely different game, even yeah. though yes, we have IP that we've built up. It would have been too much of a game. It would have been like, it would have been like starting over. Mm -hmm. um, we would have had a head start on tech, but like we would have been having to like start over in terms of understanding the customer, which is one of the hard, like one of the hard, hardest parts. And so, you know, the key part of a pivot is you have to have learned something in, in to like leverage that piece of like knowledge um, and, and, and use that, right? Like you have to have validated something and then like basically have a slight adjustment. Sometimes like there's these different terms, like a zoom in pivot, which is, you built this thing and it turns out there's one feature that really people love. And so your entire product ends up becoming that. It just focuses on that one feature. Like you basically extract that feature from what you built. Yeah. Um, there's like all these different sort of like terms now that have come around in terms of talking about like the language around describing how, how and in what way are we pivoting? But like the key part there was like, it's not a pivot. If you just call it a pivot, a pivot truly has to have some sort of piece that you're keeping that where there was some sort of validated insight. Mm -hmm. um, Makes sense. And so that important, again, was going back to like lessons learned painfully. Like I have a friend who, and I've gone, I'm sure there are moments where I've been like, Oh, we're pivoting. And if I were to describe, but well, what are we actually keeping the same? It, be, it like very little. Um, yeah. and I think that's a very important thing to be mm -hmm. aware of. And that's also why having friends and I think Ted, you'd asked a little bit around like, um, ways to like build stuff faster. Part of that is like having a good network and like a community of other smart founders who you can talk to and get their feedback. And like, you know, I'll often ask people like, am I, it's tough, right? Cause like on one hand it's like, you can't outsource, um, 
decision making to someone else, but I do ask people for like gut responses yeah. and like, am I crazy? Um, and, and also just asking for feedback on how would you go about testing this? And like, do you know anyone who like knows the space? You know, another common conversation, by the way, Davis, we are well over the 30 minute mark. <laughs> That's okay. uh, which I'm fine with, guys, I'm fine with. We can always trim this down if we need to. But another common topic that we have, whether it's on podcasts or something Davis and I just kind of joke about is the life of an entrepreneur. I think every every person at some point in their life goes, man, I want to own my own business. I want to do my own thing. Why? Because they have dreams of grandeur. They have dreams of freedom. They have dreams of making big money. But what most people I don't think really calculate, because you, you really can't understand until you do it is the time suck. You know, being an mm -hmm. entrepreneur is 24 seven. When you own your own business, you're literally in charge of everything. When you are a nine to five person, you just, you clock in, you clock out, everything else is being done behind the scenes except your job. And that is a, a tough thing, a tough realization, I think for a lot of people to, to come to once they get into the, the world of owning their own business. So we talk a lot about work-life balance, right? What we can handle versus what our wives, what our, what our kids necessarily want from us. So how do you balance that as an entrepreneur, as, especially in the tech space where it is so consuming, so fast-paced, where the expectation is really you got to be on it? I, I, I mean, I manage it very imperfectly, <laughs> which would be like the, the uh, I think the, uh, that would be like... <laughs> really yeah. uh yeah of the century um i think part of it is like part of the stuff that i've learned has been keep like there's an expression like keep what's important important there's like a few strategies and tools that i've acquired and like over the years i think that has helped me um stay we'll call it focused um, like I've had an exec, like a virtual executive assistant for like 12 years. Huh. So learning how to delegate and like areas of both my personal life, as well as my, uh, business, like creating, like basically like having her responsible for them. Mm. Um, and, you know, creating call it like standard operating procedures around, um, all the different things. And so like, Oftentimes, like, you know, and, and frankly, uh, a lot of it for me is like, I really going back to like, I think at the beginning of the show, so I'm like, I really am nerdy around tools and product productivity. And so systems design was actually something that's always very much appealed to me. Part of my challenge is oftentimes I want to eliminate every sort of piece of friction and people always involve friction, even if you're like outsourcing, which is, I think as an engineer, why I love building software. Cause I'm like the software, oh, well, I'll say the, the software doesn't always behave the way you want it to, but at least with software, like you can streamline uh, to a great extent, all of it until things go wrong. Yeah. People are a bit more uh, say, like hands-on and especially in like dealing with feelings and stuff like that. I think it's, um, but knowing how to create leverage is really mm -hmm. important. And that's something that uh, like, I won't like there's, there are our idiosyncrasies of mine that like, I see is really smart, calculated decisions that my friends are like, they can never do it. Like I eat the same thing every day. Um, I hired a nutritionist. I hired a, like a, 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 a trainer around my fitness goals because I was like, and I want, I, I follow macros, but like the, the trainer put together and like modifies my macros in order to accomplish my goals. Like for me, I very much for a while now have been like, how can I hire experts to do the thing that like, I just, I, that, I, that is not most important to me. And I'm good at following a plan and then having like a system for reviewing my progress and then working with the expert to modify the, the, the plan um, based off of progress or lack thereof. Um, mm -hmm. In a lot of ways, I'm much better mm -hmm. at following those like processes around those things than, than like I try to figure that out for my own businesses too, right? Like measuring, are we making progress in the company? And I've, I've certainly mm -hmm. improved at that, but like, you know, with, with fitness, at least it's like, are you losing weight? Um, are you like gaining weight? Are you like, how is, how is your, your, your fat percentage changing? Like stuff like that is relatively straightforward to at least measure. Um, and so, yeah, I'm very much a, uh, believer in figuring out how to create leverage. Um, and I'm able, 
to create leverage and weight in areas that other people are like, no, I can't eat the same thing every day. Well, that unfortunately what you, what you eat, you're at least making that decision twice a day. That's yeah. a, in my mind, a lot of decisions. I, people don't realize how many decisions they make and going back to the thing, what you're saying about like being an entrepreneur is 24 seven, uh, yeah. certainly can feel that way is like you, a lot of what you need to do is figure out how to make decisions quickly and imperfectly or eliminate decisions, get them off your plate. Because like I frantically, frantically is maybe the wrong term, but like, I always am trying to figure out how can I eliminate decisions? Mm. Um, and oftentimes it's that the like, I'll just simplify and try to simplify something down to its essence. From your, from your seat there, Ben, and everything you've done, I'm obviously very much interested in sales in any side, inside of any organization being, you know, the tech guy that you are and the companies you've started, what's been the biggest um, roadblock, biggest struggle with you and your and your companies and your teams that you've you know gone to, to to battle with in terms of acquiring customers. What's been the biggest sticking point that you you racked your brain off around, or has it always just been smooth sailing? Like we acquire customers like nobody's business. I was like, I don't think any of my stories up until this point have ever indicated smooth sailings. Uh, <laughs> so I think going back to what I was saying, like. So my advice to younger Ben was around like distribution matters more than product in a lot of circumstances. And I'd say arguably in most situations, um, you have to have, cause like you can have a great product and if you can't figure out how to acquire customers, you're not going to have a business. It's just as simple as that. There are plenty of examples of like, we'll call it mediocre products with great distribution that are great, fantastic businesses. Um, I, I'm not an expert at marketing and sales. I, what I will say is that I, like, I have some qualities that make me effective at sales when I'm like, um, and I'm always trying to get better. I think one of the things is I truly enjoy consultative sales. So I enjoy like under, like someone coming to me with their problems and helping them figure it out. Right. And, um, if there's ideally with some sort of technical component that I'm like, I know the area, um, because that's where I can be like, provide the most amount of value. And like, I would love doing that all day long for free. Um, obviously can't do that. And I do enjoy building money. I do enjoy money. And also like a measure I would say of like satisfaction for me is building something that people is so helpful that people will, will like, in, will, will invest money, uh, for, for, for it. Like that's, yeah. that's also really important to me. So it's not just giving advice. I think it's also like that it's so valuable or, or help. Um, it's so valuable that people will invest their hard earned money to, to, for in exchange for it. Um, but yeah, with every business, like, so with cart hook, um, we, cart hook's actually not a great example because we weren't able to be listed in the Shopify app store. Um, mm -hmm. but a lot of other companies, uh, who were around, who were like in our cohort, I'll call it a cohort of, of companies that were fairly early in Shopify. They were in the Shopify app store and that was like a really powerful acquisition channel for them. I will say what we did get, what we did benefit from was integrations. And so at various points in like the cart hook journey, one of our most important customer acquisition channels was an integration with a platform called CrateJoy. That mm -hmm. was a way for people to send, uh, um, basically like a box of the month, uh, like a, a physical box of the month of like, oftentimes you'd see like selling, sending food or like samples. Like, um, and this was a platform similar to Shopify, but it just, it was specialized specifically in helping people create like box of the month, um, businesses. And that we became like, sort of like the exclusive at the time the product was helped recover abandoned shopping carts on the store. So if someone just entered in their email address on the checkout page and then didn't complete the purchase, our tool would grab that email and then send them like a, a sequence of emails to try to get them to come back and complete their purchase. For the first like nine months of the business, we were acquiring customers through like cold outreach by like, you know, got a list of emails using, I think like built with at the time doing research on every single store in the database and like doing, and then hiring like um, a couple people to like do like outbound. Mm -hmm. we got more 
sales through just that integration with create joy than I think we collectively ever did in cold outbound. Um, hmm. It became like a very powerful way for us to grow. Another one was we integrated with a subscription platform called recharge and recharge at the time was like the, and still is like the leading subscription solution on Shopify. And again, like once, if you were using recharge, you obviously had, or you naturally would have a, a lot of abandoned shopping carts. And so our tool, our integration, which was shown directly within their product became essentially free advertising for us. And so when I'm starting businesses, especially in B2B, I'm always looking for integration partners as a way for us to acquire customers. Like there's other ways too, that you'll see businesses approach customer acquisition. Like you, I think the way that we most think about it is like, oh, like sales team or like doing founder led sales, which realistically is what you're going to do when you're first starting a business. Um, you know, but there's also affiliate marketing, there's influencer marketing, like in the e-commerce space. One of the things that I've seen a lot of is companies who are selling e-commerce tools that are bringing on investors who are just influencers in the e-commerce space. So they're yeah. getting on their cap table, they're getting equity in exchange for essentially referrals. Yeah. Um, and especially in this world where people are building up audiences on LinkedIn, Instagram, TikTok, Twitter, like that is very powerful in part because word of mouth um, is just a really effective tool. Um, now, you know, there's challenges there around like, well, are you, is someone referring a product because they're on the cap table or because they actually believe it? And oftentimes these influencers aren't actually um, even saying that they're incentivized uh, for referring the product. I'm always just curious to hear what people think about sales, because if you look at an organization in the org chart, everybody has a different view of sales. Right. The CEO mm -hmm. loves sales because they know it's the lifeblood of a company, HR, accounting, project management. They may be indifferent. They may hate you because they don't like working with you personally. They may love you because, they, you know, they love working with you. But what's what's a common theme is that there's a reason why salespeople get paid the way they do. And that's because getting in getting a business, a product or a service in front of another business or a consumer, direct to consumer is the hardest part about running a business, in my opinion, because operationally, you can always figure those things out. There's a bunch of tools out there that you can plug in, you can outsource this, you can outsource that, you can bring different people into it. But acquiring the customer, just and just, just even the first touch, just getting somebody to listen to you, agree to a meeting, mm -hmm. agree to a demo, have a coffee, whatever, is the toughest part. And there's really an art around it. So I, I like to just ask because you always get varying opinions. And for us in junk, you know, I'm, I'm fortunate because I've been in the B2B space with my IT sales job, um, enterprise sales, selling IT services. I mean, that's, that's a tough, it's a tough ball game um, and, and, a, and, and certainly a unique sale, sales process, very long. On the other side of the spectrum is junk removal, which is, <laughs> is very reactive, a lot of inbound. You better answer that call literally when, it, when, it, when my phone rings here in five seconds. And if you don't, that customer's on to the next person. With that, though, Ted, what Ted and I are trying to figure out and go after is just the other side of sales with junk removal, which are corporate partnerships, which is much more outbound, much more proactive. And so there is a strategy there that we have to figure out as, as the owners of this company of how do we go and get a corporate partnership set up with Walmart or public storage or, you know, any of these, uh, you know, places that have brick and mortar buildings that likely have waste and bulky item removal needs, pallets, old buggies, people illegally dumping mattresses out by the, by the waste bins, like all that stuff, they need this service. And so there is an art to that sale that is way different than the other sale that we have that exists inside of our company, which is reactive, answer the phone, answer the text and get on it immediately. So again, that's, that, that's why I asked the question, but Ted, do you have one more you wanna ask? Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, actually, two very quick questions. I promise. So the first right. one is the first one is um, who are your favorite entrepreneurs, uh, influencers, tech leaders, you name it, that you follow, and why? I'd say I go through these. Uh, I mean, th there have been various points in my career where I've gravitated towards particular individuals. Currently, yeah. right now, it's Hermosi, uh, and then there's a there's a couple people in the to call them influencers would be like sort of the wrong term, but basically they're influencers around like they're entrepreneurs who do, I would say do a good job of writing about the things they're thinking about and turning that into content and building up a newsletter. 
in an audience. So like Justin Welsh is one, his whole thing is he's built up a bunch of like through, through essentially through, uh, courses and content, he's built multiple million dollar income streams and he's raised no money. He's just done it specifically through specifically around sales. He writes a lot about sales. Last and most important question is being from Maine. What is the best lobster roll in New York city? <laughs> What's funny about that is I grew up hating lobster. <laughs> Did you really? Oh, that is funny. Yeah, I, I found it. I found it like icky. I thought it was like the fact you had to crack it open. Like I always, I liked, I liked eating like the the claws, but like I found like the whole like disassembling the lobster part like not attractive at all. I, uh, so I don't eat. I don't eat lobster. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, which also, I think, growing up in like a fishing town, it's like it's like, it's it's, ir it's ironic, but also natural. It's kind of like people who I also grew up on a tree farm, and I live in Manhattan, and I have for like the, the last like, like fifteen years or so. It's like I've rebelled against the thing that is most <laughs> in really my funny. environment. But Ben, we appreciate the time, man. It was a no. a great episode, selfishly for us. Hopefully, our audience feels the same and uh you've obviously got a lot of insight so maybe maybe further on down the line we'll dive deeper into a single thread and, and have you back on but uh hope you have a great weekend thanks again all right thanks a lot for having me all right thanks so much ben thanks <laughs>